We often find that many of the most intriguing, enigmatic, and as yet unexplained ancient ruins found all over our world are regularly claimed as the legacy of more recent, well-studied, permitted ancestors. However, this constant attribution to lesser developed ancestors, studied and understood intimately through funded investigation, is self-contradictory in nature. For the parallel study of said ages, and in turn early man's development, disproves their own claim of said individual's culpability or indeed capabilities. It seems that, although only a specific tale of events is publicly permitted for grants, offering financial security to so-called professors and historians, all willing to toe the proverbial line, inadvertently expose themselves without any outside intervention. Due to the detailed, well-established understandings possessed by modern archaeological study, we are, by default, also made intimately aware of the tools available to each of the claimed culprits, the knowledge levels in which they possessed, and the fact that many other factors regarding our not-so-distant ancestors disproves academia's own testimony when it comes to them as claimed builders. However, although, in our opinion, there is overwhelming evidence to suggest that many ancient ruins were instead re-inhabited by these claimed constructors, utilizing these ancient sites, often fortresses, beneficial, often ingenious, and baffling constructions safely, virtually impenetrable designs, and thus solid foundations for the development of their own civilizations, not only allowed them to flourish, but also leaving behind a detailed array of archaeological finds used as the basis of academia's claim of these groups having built these sites, but also claiming such sites as their work in historical records, records which are always absent any explanation as to how this was achieved. There also exist sites on Earth that, instead of allowing funded individuals to use additional re-inhabitations as a basis for an argument for their origins, can instead Due to the sheer mass of these historical footprints, each stacked atop one another, can instead actually indicate the site's enormous age. A land feature generated as a result of this incredibly long-lived accommodation that we call tells. Tells are artificial mounds formed from the accumulated refuse from generations of people. Tells are most commonly associated with the archaeology of the ancient Near East, but they are also found elsewhere, such as Central Asia, Eastern Europe, West Africa, and Greece. Within the Near East, they are concentrated in less arid regions, including Upper Mesopotamia, the Southern Levant, Anatolia, and Iran, which had more continuous settlement. What can only be explained as man-made, artificially generated sedimentary layers, one has to ask themselves how long would a particular site have to have been inhabited for to create such enormous, incredibly deep layers of earthwork, merely generated by its inhabitants living in said area, clearly for an unimaginably long period of time? The herbal citadel, for example, locally called Kalat, is a tell located within the historical city center of Erbil in the Kurdistan region of Iraq. The citadel appeared for the first time in historical sources in the Ibla tablets around 2300 BC, and although it has been confirmed as having been inhabited as far back as the Neolithic period, we have long argued due to their activities and capabilities that the Neolithics were a surviving remnant of the most recent lost civilization. If this is so, then it is highly likely that the citadel of Erbil is in fact far older than that of even the Neoliths, its incredible height, also indicative of an inconceivably long history of virtually continuous inhabitation. How old is the herbal citadel, or indeed the world's tells in general? Is it an earthwork merely started by our Neolithic ancestors? Or is it possibly a relic spanning far before currently understood or indeed accepted timelines for man? They are, undoubtedly, highly compelling.
Neolithic man is often talked of as if he were a very different being to that of the modern man. Throughout the modern era, a well-funded, close-knit, often aristocratic academia has portrayed Neolithic man as an illiterate figure, often leopard-print toga-wearing, club-wielding, bearded nincompoop, a grubby, forceful, filthy beast who had barely managed to master the art of creating fire, let alone complex language or societal behaviors. This paradigm of us emerging for the first time from the last ice age, developing into the complex, advanced civilization we find ourselves in, means that Origins of Man is somewhat of a closed book. For to preserve this influential dominance within modern society, anything which contradicts this long-attested claim is simply thrown out, discarded as an anomaly, and any who pursue such avenues of inquiry a mere conspiracy theorist, this regardless of the evidence we so eagerly put forth in our defense. Countless still existing astonishing anomalies, unexplained, simply baffling feats of ancient engineering, so often covered here on our channel, either merely ignored or claimed as absent an explanation as to how, the work of our well-studied more recent ancestors, people who were simply incapable of completing such mammoth tasks. Many of these ancient ruins, claimed as more recent achievements, we feel, possess sufficient evidence to support far greater ages littering many said sites, clearly built using far more advanced precision technologies and Neolithic sites are of no exception. We believe here on the channel that the size of many of these highly eroded prehistoric stone trilithons, and indeed stones contained within many enormous dolmens, are also left by this ancient group. Dolmens made using similar, if not identical techniques throughout the world, from Scotland to Ireland to Japan, all of similar design and possessing inexplicable features, board entrances, multi-ton megaliths. It is as if this group still possessed the knowledge of how to lift and work such stones, but had lost the technologies used to carve with precision. It is as if they were a surviving remnant of a once more capable or more precisely better equipped civilization. How did this ancient people, academically claimed as never having had any contact, build such similar structures? Or perhaps, more importantly, and the feature which initially attracted us to Neolithic ruins, the size of their stonework. Megaliths often incorporated into their structures, forming trilithons or entrance tunnels, with top slabs upon dolmens, sometimes up to 8 feet aloft, weighing well over 100 tons. Our discoveries at Newgrange in Donor in Meath, Ireland, with a slab tunnel entrance, like so many Neolithic granges and barrows, regardless of their immense size, once precisely aligned them with solstices, yet they remain mostly buried and thus most conveniently concealed. Some argue that the most impressive Neolithic dwellings can be found dotting the Japanese landscape. However, we feel the most archaeological interesting of Neolithic sites dot the United Kingdom, France, and some areas of the US, yet particularly Scotland and Ireland. Sites which have fragments of ancient symbols left within, celestial alignments, and a similar pattern decoration or possibly coded message which crop up over and over, especially one found all over the world, of a strange enigmatic spiral. And although usually found sparsely decorating Neolithic sites, barrows, and internal earthworks, its reoccurrence so regularly must indicate it as once having been significant and important to them in some way. Yet for some reason, Gavernus is undoubtedly the most spectacular of them all. This little shared ruin displays this symbol significance in their carvings as seemingly fanatically overwhelming. Located in France, to have so many of these patterns clearly arranged in careful and concise manners by a people capable of aligning 100-plus ton rocks with pinpoint accuracy, we feel should be perceived as a very deliberate and important undertaking, perhaps in an attempt to convey a message to a future people, a people far removed from themselves in terms of language, a fact they may have fully understood, 
having, as we believe, experienced global cataclysm within living memory. So encoded messages, yet to be deciphered or even recognized as such, hidden within symbolism rather than writings. Are Gavrinus's spirals mere decoration? If so, why go to such great efforts? Are these spirals an ancient code? Possibly a warning, a message yet to be unraveled. Whoever created Gavrinus, and for whatever purpose, remains a mystery yet to be solved. Gavrinus is a place very much still unexplained, yet very rarely shared academically. As such, it is a place we find highly compelling.